Okay. I think I said that was the end of chapter six during the last one, but it was the end of chapter seven. This is chapter eight. It's getting quite late right now. It's, it's after seven o'clock at night and the sun is just blinding me. <laughs> I'll keep on keeping on. The Minotaurs ran to the shore when news spread that a white trader had come. They swarmed around our big canoe. They pointed to the trader's piles of meat and his trading goods. Musicians with drums and rattles and turkey bone whistles marched the trader to the council ground. Otter Woman and I trailed along behind. They built a great fire in front of the longhouse and danced. Black Moccasin spoke a welcome. He said many good things about the man who had brought me home to the village. His name was Toussaint Charbonneau. Black Moccasin called him the Frenchman. All during the talk, Charbonneau clung to my arm as though he was afraid I might run away. Red Hawk stood beside his father and did not listen to the talk. His eyes were fixed on Charbonneau. Red Hawk left and went into the lodge. As the talk ended, he swaggered out and stood beside his father. He had changed his clothes. Before, he had worn a breechcloth and a coyote skin thrown over his shoulders. Now he was dressed in a beaded robe, a necklace of bear claws, and leggings decorated with porcupine quills. The moment his father's talk came to an end, Red Hawk pushed himself between Charbonneau and me. It was a hostile act. The Frenchman backed away. He stood facing Red Hawk, his shaggy head lowered, his huge shoulders bent forward. The firelight shone in his eyes. He looked like a wounded bear. Black Moccasin silenced both of the men with a sharp command. He grasped my arm, led me through the crowd into the lodge, sat me down by the fire, and threw a buffalo robe over my shoulders. He asked what had happened to me during the long time I had been gone. And when I told him, he was not troubled about Long Rock or about either Tall Rock or Le Bourne, only about Toussaint Chorbonneau. You saw him on the river, he said. Did you call to him? I waved my cape. But you did not cry out or act as though you were in danger. Mm. No. Did you ask him to bring you here? No, he asked me if I wanted to go to the village and I said yes. I knew what Black Moccasin was thinking. If the Frenchman had saved me from danger or captured me from an enemy, then by the law of all the tribes, I belonged to, to Toussaint Charbonneau to do with as he pleased. You are to marry Red Hawk, my son, Black Moccasin said. That is settled. That is decreed. It does not matter what the Frenchman thinks or wishes. He will not harm you. He thinks too much of the trades he makes with us, nor will he run off with you as Tall Rock did. Black Moccasin poked the fire with his walking stick and waited for me to say something. I was too confused to say a word. I should have said, I do not like Red Hawk and I do not think I will be happy with him. And if I am unhappy, then he will be unhappy too. But these words from a slave girl, not yet even 14, to the chieftain of the Minotauries would be foolish. In truth, I should have jumped up and run in rings. A Shoshone, a slave, a captive to marry the son of the great chief? How fortunate I was. I see you are troubled, the chief said. Even my old ears can hear your heartbeat. Calm yourself, stay in the lodge. Do not go out for any reason not until the Frenchman leaves. Why? He says one thing, but he means another. You do not trust him? No. He is half white and half Sioux. When will he go? Before the next moon. Then he goes to trade with one eye. You know who one eye is, remember? The born. One eye does not like to have us pick things over too much. Black Moccasin called his wives and told them to give me food and to put me to bed and to keep me there until the sun came on another day. Then, see that she has something to do. She is not to go into the village. I followed him to the doorway and looked out. 
The council place overflowed with people. The pitchwood fire burned high and sent black clouds spinning in the air. Toussaint Charbonneau and the girl were dancing, a dance I had never seen before. They hopped around like frogs. It's the white man's dance, Black Moccasin said. They dance because of the whiskey that builds a fire in their bellies. Not to the sun, not to the moon, not to the great spirit below us, above us, around us everywhere. The Frenchman stopped dancing. He upended a leather bag and drank from it. There is a thing I do not understand, I said. You have told me that Charbonneau will not harm me, yet I must stay here in the lodge until he leaves. I have been away from my friends for a long time. I would like to talk to them. Black Moccasin frowned. He was not used to having a girl question him. But patiently he said, The Frenchman will not harm you, for it would mean his death. But if you walk in the village, it is sure to cause trouble between him and my son, or bad feelings. And I do not want bad feelings. I want Charbonneau to come back. My people like to trade with him. If you are out of sight, he will forget you. He has forgotten many girls along this river, and other rivers too. Charbonneau was dancing again, this time with lightning in her hair, one of my friends, the prettiest girl among all the Minotauris. I watched Charbonneau leap about with lightning in her hair. She leaped too. She seemed to be happy. The fire glistened on his hairy face. He still looked like a wounded bear. Gladly I will sit in the lodge. I do not wish to see this man again, I said to myself. The Frenchman traded all the next day. The wives of Black Moccasin came back from the trading place with a shiny knife, an iron kettle to cook in, three long sewing needles, and a length of pink goods, enough to make four dresses. There was no word from the Frenchman himself, but the women said that he was in a happy mood. He joked with everyone, took long drinks from his leather jug, and sang songs they did not understand but he did not say a word about me. Word came later, the next day at noon. It was brought by Black Moccasin. I could see that it was bad when he sat down next to me during by the fire. You are not to blame us if things go wrong, he said, if you have to marry Toussaint Charbonneau and not my son. I was sewing on a deerskin robe. I stopped sewing to stare at him. The Frenchman went into a rage when he heard that you and Red Hawk were to be married. He took a knife from his belt and stormed around, threatening everyone in the village. He stormed at me. I told him that the marriage was decreed long before you came. He said that you were near death from the winter cold when he rescued you. He asked me why I had not gone out to search for you, why no one had rescued you. I jumped to my feet. I was not dying when he found me. I had shelter and fire and food. In a very short time, the river would have frozen over and I could have walked to the shore. This is true as you say it, but to him, it is not true. To him, you were saved from death. Therefore, you are his. The same as if he had found a wounded beast with arrows in it. Not the same, I said. When the Frenchman found me, I was not a wounded beast, nor am I a wounded beast now. Black Moccasin gave me a straight look. He was displeased that his judgment was questioned, that I dared speak in such a voice. I had a strong feeling that my fate had already been decided. I was to marry the Frenchman, no matter what my feelings were. Not only did an honorable law demand it, Charbonneau was a traitor whose friendship was very important to the tribe. He must not leave the village an angry man who felt that he had been treated poorly. Smile, Black Moccasin said. I will smile too. A plan of mine may work. Have you played the hand game? Yes, Shoshone children play it. It is not played in Metaharta for fun, only to settle arguments, such as what arrow of many arrows has killed a buffalo. Three will play the game, Toussaint Charbonneau and Red Hawk. 
and Laborn all claim you. Laborn? I said, surprised. Why does he claim me? He says that he took you away from the scoundrel Talrock and protected you. He says that you ran away and hid. In his village of Hidatsa, this is a crime. The punishment is death. From all that you told me, you did run away from him and hide. Laborn is a brute. I have heard you say it. Why must you listen to him? Because he rules a village more powerful than mine. I cannot stand against one eye and his village, which is bigger than Metaharta by two times. My heart stopped beating. If Redhawk loses the game, then I belong to either Charbonneau or Laborn. That is the rule. There was no other, but Redhawk will not lose. He never loses. He always wins. My heart started to beat again. Why does Red Hawk never lose? Because he always receives help from the great spirit who guards our village. The spirit helps him to see through flesh and bone, through the closed hands of those he plays against, into the palm of their hands. He can see as clear as if it lay right there beside the fire what is in the hands. Who holds the plum seed that is carved with the sign of the moon or the seed that is uncarved? Do the Frenchmen and Le Bourne know that Red Hawk never loses? If they did know, they would not play. When does the game start? Tonight is the best time for Red Hawk. His spirit sees better in the dark than in the light. He never loses when the game is played in the dark. Tonight is the night he will play because the moon will cast shadows. When Black Moccasin left me, I got ready to speak to my talisman. I could not go into the village and find a quiet place. I could not see her in the sky now, but she was there waiting for the night to come. I went and lay beside my bed and waited. And that was the end of chapter eight.